right the next big literature exam on wednesday <coughs> i've done lord of the flies video um power and conflict poetry um it all comes down to two key things basically comparison and methods if you're not comparing you're not going to get as many marks um even if you write very very articulate analysis and if you don't mention methods again that'll limit how high up mark scheme you can go and also how well you're explaining and even that um analyzing it um you know what how you answer the question so these are the keywords um you need to be you in like using these all the way through whether you were talking about how similar they are or how different they are i would as much as you revise the poetry i would revise these words because you must talk about them both otherwise you are not answering the question which is compare how Heaney presents the power of nature and storm on the island with one other poem the first word is compare and and most of the poems will fit well all of the poems will fit into these key areas um, this is from uh, a QA document and right at the start of the course when they launched GCSE so you have power of humans and nature powerfulness of anger guilt fear pride effects of conflict power of conflict power of memory power of or conflict in identity and even they can go as granular as individual experiences um, compare how we presents the individual experience of conflict in poppies and one of the poem but i would have thought that and the question would be more accessible than that but you never know but fundamentally it's about these two key words is it power is it conflict i would if i was revising i would just um, write a list and next to each of these you know which are the best poems you would want to use f f and forget the one they give you if they give you a question about the power of humans, do you want to talk about Zamandius and one man? Do you want to talk about London and the whole um, um, social structure, the elites? Um, power of nature, do you want to talk about the prelude and how it's so powerful it scares him to retreat in his boat? I would go through them and think, right, if I get that question, it doesn't matter what poem they give me, I've got two or three poems I can use. And if you've got that in your head and you walk into that exam almost in control of the situation because you know what you were going to write about the other thing i would really try and work on is if you're talking about the power of, of conflict or the power of nature or the effects of conflict or a problem of identity or memory you need to be um, putting value judgments on them and these adjectives and adverbs they might not all be that um, you know, the poppy shows us the um, traumatizing effect of war on a mother. Remains and shows us the harrowing effect of like fighting in that war, and then the traumatizing effect. Um, Storm on the island shows a terrifying power of nature. Are you making a value judgment about the theme? Because the poet is. The poet is trying to convey an idea. Poetry is a distillation of an emotion or undescribable thing in a concise form that uses words to convey an idea. Nature is powerful. Nature is bad. There we go. That's quite a basic sentence. But what these poets do is they take that concept and they try and elaborate through metaphors and similes and imagery and they try and convey the power of something we cannot quite grasp because it is immeasurable. So sitting in a trench for four years during World War One, how do you get that across? How do you get the the pain and the suffering and the trauma? He writes exposure and he tries to get it across. Um, you lose a child to war. You cannot describe that in simple words so in poppy she tries um the anger at the way history is presented as only white and your whole racist history is um neglected that is shown in, in checking out my history and he condenses that into one 
short poem that you know using language and sound and imagery conveys these feelings that is what poetry is about um, and because it says compare you're talking about similarities and differences so similarities can be just as important um, the prelude in Ozymandias shows how all powerful nature is you can't avoid it man cannot compete with it um, exposure and remains show the unrelenting horror of war um, the emigre and tissue show how your very identity can be linked with um, you know the past and various different aspects that don't go anywhere near to adding up to who you are and kamikaze and, and poppy show the effect of conflict on a family so there's a lot of similarities as well as all the myriad and differences the journey and this is something a lot of of students fall into the trap of <clears throat> don't just think i'm going to go in and go through and the poem line by line and every time you reach a technique you explain oh the writer uses this simile for this effect this way they are all interlinked so you need to think about the journey why is the start of Ozymandias powerful? Because actually the end of the poem connects back to it and increases it. So, as an example, and I'll try and keep this brief because I can imagine you're um, bored of my voice already. So in Ozymandias, he starts with... I met a traveller from an antique land. Straight away, there's a sense of the exotic, the mysterious, um, strange civilizations that we don't know about. Yet it ends with alone and level sands. There's nothing left to that civilization. Now you could read into that as just the um, the hubris of Ozymandias. He had the statue built, but he didn't last. The civilization didn't last. So it's about the hubris of man, the tyranny of men that think they are more than they are but and time and nature will always overcome them or on a much deeper reading you could talk about the fact that um, Percy Shelley was living in a great age where sort of ideas and thought were coming and forward and people were generally very optimistic about the future they thought it was an idea of romanticism and and, um, and enlightenment and these old grand civilizations with their statues and the pyramids were were literally dust. But there was a different world, a modern world. Um, like London, it, in a journey, it starts with, I wander through each charge street. This is, you know, like London at the turn of the 19th century. This is the most amazing city on earth. It was all the world's resources were coming up the Thames. The empire was providing us great wealth. However, by the end of it, he's talking about plagues. It is built on suffering, on them suffering. There is no care for the poor. How can a great Christian nation, a great Christian city have so much poverty? And if you look at the church and the other aspects of the poem, his journey is one of disgust as he, unco as he almost peels the layers back of what has made this city what it is. The prelude it starts with one summer evening that's quite a positive sentence it's summer it's nature it's wonderful by the end of it his dreams are troubled nature has disturbed him he and he thought he knew more than he did nature has taught him a lesson and you need to talk whatever you pick out of each poem you need to always relate it to that big overarching journey that the speaker is on in my last duchess that's my last duchess painted on the wall by the end of it, he talks about a random seahorse statue. He only likes objects. He likes property, doesn't like people. The patriarchy has treated this woman awfully. And it it comes back to status and wealth rather than his wife. Right, Charge of a Light Brigade is slightly different. Half league, half league, half league onward. It's almost... A reveling in the glory of this charge look at them charge and then at the end the noble 600 well we know that's ironic because they were noble they were brave but they died you know 600 that went in 
and many of them never came out. So the journey of the, of the poem is full of this almost poignant glory that it was for nothing, but it was still glorious. Exposure. Our brains ache in the merciless icy winds at Nivus. The, you know, been attacked by nature. It's our, it's the collective. They're soldiers in the midst of great horror and, 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 and suffering. But by the end of it, all their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. It is for nothing. Wilfred Owen, the great tragedy of his life was he died before the end of the war. He did not know it would end. As far as he was concerned, it was going to go on forever. It was, and, and the relentlessness of the war is shown in the fact that all their eyes are going to become ice. They're all dead, really. They can never go home the same because they've suffered this great and trauma in the war and nothing happens. They're just stuck with suffering. Storm on the island. We are prepared. We build our houses squat. It's the collective suffering of the Irish people. And by the end of the poem, strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. Because they are a we. You know, they are together. Like, And they are prepared. And they build their houses squat. They're all in this together. And that collectiveness is shown even through all the bombardment and the storm and, and the conflict. There is nothing they should be afraid of if they're together. Bayonet charge. Hang on. Right. Suddenly he awoke and, and was running. The instant, the immediate res of that, the instant shock of that, he is, oh, he is awake, he is, he, he, he is in the war, he is storming towards danger. And by the end, this terror's touchy dynamite, that alliteration of the T. He is running into an explosive situation. And that seems a bit a cliche, but he is. He has no choice but to go forward because to go back makes him a coward. To go back, it makes him less of a man, less of a soldier. And by surging on, he is proving himself even under great duress. It remains. He starts off on another occasion we get sent out. There's a sense of, again, in media, as this is part of a long ordeal, this is war, this is... Just, just that one thing that happened to him that we get sent out it's the collective I was with my mates I was with the old soldiers by the end of the poem his bloody life in my bloody hands it is personal it isn't another occasion this is the occasion this is the, the you know the Macbeth allusion to guilt this is bad this isn't just a one off thing this isn't just something that happened this is the thing Poppies. She starts off with the three days before Armistice Day. This is something, it's a regular occurrence, it happens. But by the end of it, this isn't about Armistice Day. This is about her memory of him as a child. She can't forget it by his playground voice. She doesn't want to just celebrate it once a year. This is every day for her. That is and the journey sees on you know she sees the remembrance she, and, and she sees the poppies in the graveyard but basically she ends up on a journey through a memory of her son not nearly there a wolf talk for you know it, it starts off in the dark room he's finally alone but then the journey takes him through the, and the job he's done and what he had to go through to do it and then it ends up with then the people at home that do not care this is this is the tragedy of this poem. In his dark room, he's alone, like trying to make change, trying to justify his job, trying to justify to himself what he does is not exploitative, like exploitative. But and, and but for why? Because people don't care anymore. Tissue. Um, a paper that um, lets the light shine through. She's hoping to reveal something about herself. This is about her identity, who she is. Um. It's transparent, it's thin, it's delicate. Her identity is delicate. And by the end of it, turned into your skin. She is defined by what she looks like. This is a Pakistani woman born in Pakistan, which has only just existed before it was India. And she's raised in Glasgow. She mentions all the references to her sort of heritage and her culture. Who is she? You know, people look at her skin and presume... She is something, whereas she is actually a combination of lots of other things and bits of paper, your passport, the Quran, all, all these things don't 
and make and maps the you know, and make who you are. Dare McGray. Um, it sums it up in the first line. There once was a country. It doesn't exist anymore. And whether it doesn't exist because the borderlines have changed, whether it doesn't exist because um, it's not the same as she remembers it. I left it as a child. Her childish memories are always one of hope and positive. It's gone. Like the world is changing. People are displaced. This is how to reconcile that in your mind. And my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. As far as she's concerned, her existence is enough. As far as she's concerned, as long as, long as she holds a memory, that place still exists. Even if the, if the tyrants and the tanks have been there. And check it out in history. It's, it's a bit more complicated than doing the, just the and, and first and start because he's a way more complicated poet. Um, and Dem tell well that will do it. So Dem tell me, like who are they? It's that universal they. Oh, they say they. Well, what who tell him? And they don't tell him in his accent, in his in his um, dialect. We don't tell him in a way he, that recognizes his culture. And at the end, I carving out my own identity. That's quite a bold, aggressive statement of about statues and art and stone and wood and our history should be as permanent as white history and bearing in mind when this poem is written what's happened since with statues and things this is why we do it this is why it's still important because they speak power to truth finally kamikaze her father embarked at sunrise is full of hope it's her father maybe pride he is off to do this great noble adventure of of defending imperial japan from the American oppressors that are trying to invade and then at the end and sometimes she said he must have wondered which had, had been the better way to die he should have died then this isn't about the death of her grandfather or sorry her, yeah her father or even it's about death of a culture it's about the fact they lost it's about the fact he had one job to do and he didn't so you need to understand the journey in each poem in order to place all the things you say within that context so where does it play in that journey so when you talk about um in the prelude about he moves the boat like a swan because he's it's his pride it's his arrogance it's his hubris which obviously by the end of it is gone um in storm on the island the exploding comfortably is because they and they've been there for a long time and they've and weathered and they've suffered a lot so if they come together they can suffer they can like put up with more and come through it so always have that in your mind but if you've got a poem that you are right i'm going to compare this whatever fine but make sure you understand what the big idea is and how all the little pieces fit in it's like the bricks make the house the house is what you see you don't see a pile of bricks and think, "Oh, I can imagine a house like that." We well, might, but normally you see a house and you don't, and you and you don't even see the bricks because you see the house. So think about well, the house is made up of these little bits, and I'm going to put them all together. Right then, what you need to compare. If you're not comparing, you're not getting any points. Um, so say if they give you poppies or kamikaze, and the question is the effect of conflict or the effect of war. You could write something like this to start with. Straight away, you're looking at, at the big methods, the big techniques. And the biggest method of all is the voice. So both Weir and Garland show the harrowing effects of war. I've used the author's name oh, and the poet's names, and I've used the word harrowing because I'm trying to get across. I understand the tone. The Weir using first-person narrative to emphasise the mother's personal loss, the repeated use of I and you, poignantly illustrating the bond between the mother and the son. I haven't gone in, you know, you don't need to over explain I and you, because you've said it all there, it's, it's first person, it's that bond. Whereas, and I personally would be tempted to then explain a lot more about the bond between mother and son and look a lot more detail from the poem, but that's not comparing. So you really need to rein yourself in and think, well, I made a good point. Can I relate it to the other poem? 
whereas the third person narrative voice of Kamikaze graphically demonstrating the um, difference between the family members. I maybe should say demonstrating. Um, because the distance in Kamikaze is what makes the sadness. The closeness in Poppies is what shows us the anguish. That's your conclusion. That'll be good. Um, if you if you get Storm on the Island or, or Wolf Dog for, which you might, um, both Heaney and Duffy present the never-ending darkness of conflict, but from two very different viewpoints. Heaney's showing the collective effects of the bombardment on the people, whereas Duffy focuses on the soul and witness to a nightmare heat of war. Sorry, my grammar's a bit iffy there. I was typing it quite fast. Again, you've got that summary. You understand that the viewpoint and the voice is what actually has quite a big effect. The plosive sounds in Heaney's poem emphasise the relentless nature of the conflict that consumes them and also the strangeness as demonstrated in the oxymoron exploding comfortably. The sea in all its majestic power providing comfort in relation to the conflict that dominates their lives. Whereas Duffy portrays the anguish of not knowing whether the horror is conveyed by the simple list, even register in the collective consciousness of his audience anymore. Get into the detail, explain the effect, and then explain how it's similar or different to the other poem. Because if fundamentally, you're going to be choosing two poems that either have very similar ideas about the, to um, and the topic and the question, or very different ideas. And each comparative point is going to prove your initial statement about how they present that. So, think about the methods, think about the journey each poet takes you on, and compare. And really make sure you compare, because that's where the marks are. Right, good luck. I might try and do an unseen poetry one tomorrow. Um... And remember, if you do do the prelude, and make sure you relate it to the question and don't rock the boat. <laughs>